Hey everybody, the graceful and the gracious, the art of being gracious. We live in a funny world. Someone once said it's a funny old world. Same kind of concept. It's an interesting, vibrant, energetic, in some ways contentious world in which we live. Why? Well, there's so many reasons for that. In the United States, there's quite a few people who believe on the left side, right side, the good, the bad, no matter what politics you come about or societal aspects, there seems to be an A side and a B side, a one and a two. And in some ways, we have a hard time talking to the other side that doesn't believe like we believe. It's kind of the CNN and the Fox News crowd. No disrespect and certainly not picking a side, but it seems to be in some ways two camps. And there used to be a time when people would be able to talk more to each other doesn't seem to be the case as much anymore, but it can be. And it requires us more than anything to be what I would call gracious. It has some connotations within that word, and that's why we use also the word graceful, which the root is grace. That's really what I want to talk about is to have grace and graciousness in our lives and how we can do it, why we can do it, and some of the strategies that we may consider if we want to live a more gracious life. I think at the root or the foundation of all of this conversation today is this really concept of if we're graceful, gracious, have a bit of grace, we're going to live a more happy, peaceful, fulfilled life. We're going to think better of ourselves than maybe other people think of us. When you think well of yourself, you have a better attitude. In some ways, the way you present yourself is a reflection of how you really think about yourself. That's what's so, I think, gratifying about being a graceful person. It's not so much how you treat other people, it's how you feel about yourself. And that feeling about yourself is going to manifest itself in how you treat others. So let's get right into it. What's well, a graceful person? Yes, it's the way they carry themselves. Yes, it's a move of a ballet dancer as they move across the stage. Many people don't appreciate ballet dancing. I'm not one if I had to pick and say, let's go to a ballet performance. But the point is, is that there's something of grace, the way that they control and move their body in a very fluid way. It's amazing to watch the talent that somebody has, the flexibility in the way they present themselves. I use that word intentionally, right? Flexibility. In some ways, it's a flexibility in which we present ourselves to other people. How best we can convey to other people that your approach is your approach, my approach is my approach. I certainly respect yours, and I appreciate being able to see a different approach than mine. Interesting, right? It's also a demeanor a person has that has a bit of composure and dignity. When you see somebody, especially under the toughest of circumstances, and they're able to compose themselves, whether it is in a debate or an interview, they're able in some ways to step back and not let their emotions collude or compromise some of their thoughts. It's a great thing to see, actually. And last, it's a voice of someone who talks in a bright and cheerful tone. We'll talk more about cheer later. But being able to talk in a manner in which people are entranced by the way that you present yourself. It certainly is an art, a science in some ways, but more of an art. What's the difference? A science is following a prescribed manner, prescribed approach. Obviously, science is important, but an art is being adaptable and flexible to the situations that present themselves. In other words, there's not a rigid code that we can comport ourselves to, but we follow the situations that come in front of us. So grace, Graciousness and graceful all are about arts and sciences. It's about understanding a bit about how to be a gracious person, but then adapting to the situations in which we find ourselves. Gracious people. I think it's a good way to start our discussion about how to become a gracious person by looking at people who I think have been gracious. There's so many more, but I try to pick a, a sample of people that I would highlight are graceful people. We start in some ways with Princess Grace, Grace Kelly. Fantastic background. She was an actress. She came from a very prominent family. Her father had won 
an Olympic gold medal for rowing. So very famous, multimillionaire. He owned a brick factory in Philadelphia. However, she went on her own. She moved to New York, became a model, and made her own money. Got into movies, won the Academy Award for Best Actress. However, most people remember her as Princess Grace. She married Prince Rainier of Monaco. But it's the way that she presented herself, not that she just worked with the Red Cross and helped millions of people through her work there, but she was always seen as a serene type of person. Most princesses are known as Royal Highness. She was known as Her Serene Royal Highness. That's what they call them in Monaco. It was a perfect description of who she was and who she became. Willie Whitelaw is one of my favorite. Willie Whitelaw, similar to Grace Kelly, was, built, was born into a wealthy family a, family, a family of nobility. However, politics was the drive for him. And he, had, he eventually became the deputy prime minister in the United States, that would be the vice president. He had many other positions as well as home secretary, so he was in charge of keeping the streets and the country safe within England. But it really was as deputy prime, prime minister that he developed this reputation. He had a reputation as a very formidable politician, but also one of grace and graciousness. One of the newspapers upon his death said, Foolish politicians underestimate his skills. Again, relating to that formidable nature. However, one of the people that he sparred against during his life, Prime Minister Tony Blair once said, he was a generally decent man. Imagine if you have these battles within politics, and we certainly understand today that they're in some ways brutal, not very respectful. But yet one of his opponents, in the other political party actually said he was a generally decent person. Can you imagine what you would want to say as that old saying says, is figure out what they, what you want to be said at your funeral and live your life backwards. And I don't think that Willie Whitelaw would have wanted anything more than for somebody to say he was a generally decent man. When you talk about generally decent men, our women, you come up with, I think, Sidney Poitier. What an amazing human being and life this person led. He was born poor in the Bahamas. He was once shot in the leg during a race ride. Most people don't know that or maybe not remember that. He did march with Martin Luther King at one point, but he was, became an actor of some, such unequaled prominence. He was the first black actor to win a Best Actor Academy Award. Absolutely amazing. But it was really more the way that he carried himself. No bitterness, no anger towards other people, just a genuinely, like Willie Whitelaw, decent human being. We should all be so fortunate as we age and start to worry more about how people think of us as we age than when we're younger. There's a saying that came up, I came up with some years ago that in the beginning of our life, we're trying to make a living in the twilight of our life, we're trying to make a reputation. And I think in some ways, that's where many of these individuals we're moving towards is, I wanna be known for more than just wealth or position. So of those three and so many others that are gracious people, what are the common traits that they would have? There's certainly many, right? I think I'm gonna come up with four. Courteous, civil, cheerful, and friendly. If you see somebody that somebody may claim is a gracious person, or if you're looking to become what I would call as a gracious person, some person with grace, then I think you have to be courteous, you have to be civil, you have to be cheerful, and you have to be friendly. So let's talk about each of these through the remaining aspects of our presentation. There's other things thrown in too, but that's really the substance of what we want to talk about, how you at the end of this presentation can become what we would call is a gracious person. Okay, number one, courteous. It's the basic manners and common decencies that we see, that we hope to have from a person who's courteous. It's the pleases and thank yous, the excuse me's. So we don't speak ill of others and don't interrupt or speak loudly, loudly when we're having a conversation. 
When we think of those basic manners and common decencies, we think of a cultured, even a polished person, somebody who represents themselves well to other people. The second aspect is it's a bit of deference. And that's a word that may have some negative connotations, but it shouldn't really. Deference is thinking more of other people than they think of yourself. It's not necessarily thinking of yourself as less than other people. It's instead thinking that others are as good, if not better. It's a way that you look at other people. It's holding the doors for others. It's walking last in a room. It's standing when people who are older walk in or people that you respect. It's calling others sir or ma'am. It's a very deferential, but also respectful way in which we treat other people. And it's not just to their status or their stature. It's just that you feel that your fellow human being, no matter what station they have in life, is a good, decent, and honorable person. Both are signs of a confident and sophisticated person, a positive and admirable trait that we have as a person among the most enlightened people. People who are courteous are enlightened, and it manifests itself in the way that they treat other people. It reminds me that we should try to be someone good and do something great. And I tell my kids and other people that I come in contact with to be someone good. First thing is be someone good. And then try to do something great with that goodness that you have. Very similar to what Mother Teresa said is, a day lived without doing something good for others is a day not worth living. I pause because it's a really good statement. If we can do something good for someone else. You notice how being graceful and gracious is about how other people are benefited by our discussions, by our interactions, about treating others in a way that we would want to be treated. Because if we do that, what we get in return is so much more than what we could if we just did it for ourselves. About thinking more than and beyond ourselves it brings us to civility, basic civility. It's like common decency. It comes from the word relating to public life, benefiting a citizen. It's respectful behavior between people. Sadly, we just don't see this as much as we would have liked it. Granted, a century or two centuries ago, there's always been this kind of consternation, disagreement, especially with po political life. It hasn't been as great as it is today. There's certainly reasons for that. If you go back 200 years, there wasn't much taxes. There wasn't many benefits that you got from the public sector. But now the government is so much larger. It's such a considerable part of our lives. There's many more benefits to gain by being involved in the political realm. Because of that, there's more competition for resources. And when the resources become more scarce, then the competition becomes more fierce. But what we hope is that we have some kind of respectful behavior between people, a polite interaction. I'm a huge tennis fan, and there was a person by the name of Stefan Edberg. Stefan Edberg was a very famous, competent uh, champion. He won Wimbledon twice. He won a total of six Grand Slam events. Quite an achievement. Ranked number one in the world, of course. But he, and he was known, by the way, as a person of graceful elegance. But he was also a nice competitor. He won and lost with style and dignity. In fact, he was so well renowned for how he treated people and the niceties that he had against his, both his opponent but also other competitors that they named the Citizen Award for being a tennis player, which is given every year the Stefan Edberg Award. Quite amazing, right? That's how valued he was looked upon by people who played, not just with him, but even against him. Pretty amazing. And I'll tell you a quote in a second. But I first want to talk about George Washington. When he was a 14-year-old, he read something called the Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior in Company and Conversation. It became that document, that book, that he followed throughout his political life. It talked about how you should treat your opponents. Again, notice how we're talking about other people, not yourself, other people. One of the things it said is, show not yourself glad at the misfortune of another, though he were your enemy. Another said, 
When a man does all he does, though it succeeds not well, blame not him that did it. In other words, if you tried as hard as you can and it didn't work out, don't blame the person. Pretty amazing, right? Especially the first one. Show not yourself glad at the misfortune of another, though he were your enemy. In other words, don't have any sort of appreciation when somebody else fails. It takes a wise person to do that. And it brings up Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth was quite an interesting person. It's not that she was the English monarch for more years than anybody in history. Of course, people are living longer today. By 2023, 40 countries had a monarchy. That's about 7.5% of the population. It was about 35% of populations in 1950. So few of the world's population are ruled or governed by somebody who was unelected, who was a monarch. However, she represented many of those 40 countries. In fact, it's not necessarily 40 countries that had a monarchy. I think about 14 or 15 of those were all represented by England, the United Kingdom. Countries like Canada and Australia have as their monarch, Elizabeth II. Who knows how much longer that will last. But what is a monarchy? It represents the triumphs of a country's past, the advancement of their present, and hopefully the country's future. People who are monarchs are supposed to have the traits and characteristics most admired by their people. So what is civil in some ways about Queen Elizabeth? She has had to, over her many years on the throne, meet many people that she'd rather not. Again, she represented her country, and part of that representation, she had to meet people like Romanian Nicolae Ceausescu, Zimbabwean Robert Mugambe, and IRA Commander Martin McGuinness. Those individuals were not the most admired by some in England, but in her position, she had to meet these people and show them deference. Remember the word I used earlier. In fact, IRA Commander Martin McGuinness was particularly interesting. Some years previous, about 30 years previous, her uncle, Queen Elizabeth's uncle, was killed by the IRA. Also, quite a few people were killed on that boat. It was a bomb blast on a sailing yacht, a very small one. But several people were killed in addition to her uncle, and those included his grandchildren, the uncle's grandchildren. Yet, some years later, this person had attained a position of prominence, and she was required to meet him as part of her role as the figurehead of the English population. She did. She did it with class, dignity, grace, yes, and also civility. Her motto was never complain, never explain. Quite a good motto, right? Never explain, never complain. Do your job. Remember I talked about Stefan Edberg and I told you I'd mentioned something about Wimbledon? When a person is going from a building in Wimbledon to the center court, which is their very famous court, court there is a sign there. And the sign is from Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling. And the sign says, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters the same. The intent is somebody's going to lose and somebody's going to win. And the winner should treat the loser as well as the loser treats the winner. And if they both treat each other bad, neither should. But if one treats one bad, the other should treat the other better always better than you're treated. And the hope is, yes, it is the most important tennis tournament in the world. But we should treat people with a level of civility that maybe you don't see other places, but you should see it here. There's another important point I want to make about that here, which is that we see so many examples of people who are not civil, that it's becoming more rare when people are, there's a lot of people who are going to see the Wimbledon champion and the person who came in second place, a runner-up. And if they can see that runner-up exhibit a level of class, dignity, civility, then that just may change other people throughout the world. And it brings us to the third one, being cheerful. Cheerful if you win, 
cheerful if you lose, of course. About how one interprets the good and bad is determining and could be the determining factor of whether somebody is cheerful. Everybody has goods and bads, achievements and failures, hits and misses. Live long enough, aim high enough, and you are certainly going to have bads, failures, and misses. But you can find good in anybody if you only look for it. It comes down to, notice the words, self-awareness, self-belief, self-respect, self-worth. How you feel about yourself, which we've talked about very much. The people who are cheerful, yes, find good in everybody, but they also do the best they can. We often can't determine the outcomes, but we can determine the inputs. We can't determine if we're going to be successful, but we can determine what we do to try to be successful. I have a sign that says results matter. Results do matter, but what matters more is the effort. Because we can't determine if there's going to be a recession or a depression, COVID-19. But we can determine if that happens, whether we pick ourselves up or not. And last, nothing lasts. That's why I put it number three, nothing lasts. Just like the good doesn't last, the bad doesn't last either. It's a matter of how long you're going to let the last last before you change and try to move on. There's a great story and saying, it came from Orson Welles, who's a very famous writer and also producer, actor as well. He said, a good story depends on when you stop the ending. Nothing lasts, both the good and the bad. The champion of today is often the loser of tomorrow and vice versa. There's a great story, again, going back to ten tennis, of Yana Novotna. She was a female tennis player and she tragically lost the final of the Wimbledon's singles championship. It was so devastating to her that she actually cried on center court after the match. And the Duchess, who was the person giving out the awards, she actually gave her a hug, which is very odd for someone of royalty. It's a very humanistic thing to do, but you don't see it as much. And she told her, you'll be back. Several years later, Yana Navatna did come back and she was in the finals and she won. It's a great achievement of her life. And it makes us remember that the happy are those who enjoy the struggle to the top, the rewards once there, and the opportunity that is going to come when you fail, that you have another chance to rise again. We often think that the world and our life is just one straight line. And in fact, it's really a squiggly line full of ups and downs. The important part is the trajectory. As long as you keep going up, I read sometime ago, fail fast, fix it and move on. Kind of a very interesting statement, but I think it's true. If you lose Wimbledon, you fail, now fix it and move on. Great lesson to remember. And that lesson includes this. If I'm a duck and someone calls me a donkey, it doesn't make me a donkey. It's a very trite statement. I've used it with my kids for years. If I'm a duck and someone calls me a donkey, it doesn't make me a donkey. Remember I talked about other people so much in this presentation? If we focus so much on other people and what they say about us, not what we think about them, but what they say about us, it can be debilitating. Someone may call us names that either are true or aren't true. And if our self-worth is consumed by what other people think, if we live our life according to how others think we should, then we'll find ourselves absolutely paralyzed to do anything about our future that becomes our own to make our life as good as we think it can be. And so when somebody calls you something that you know is not true, it shouldn't have a debilitating impact on you. I used to tell my daughter when she was growing up and people would say something, she had brown hair. And I said, do you have blonde hair? She goes, no. I said, if somebody said you had blonde hair, what would you say? Well, I don't have blonde hair. That's not true. I go, what's well, the same about your personality or your smile? If you know that that's clearly not true, why would you give any credence or value to somebody who said something derogatory to you? In fact, if somebody says something negative to you, it says more about them and the life they lead than 
what you lead or what life you possibly could lead. Last but not least, being friendly. What's interesting is that we spend so much more time apart than together. It's continuing. There's several statistics I can point out. 60% order delivery or takeout each week. We don't go into restaurants and sit down as much as we used to. 38% work from home at least part-time. Group memberships and fraternal and other organizations has fallen dramatically. In fact, this is interesting. 54% um, of people talk to their neighbors a couple times a week some years ago, but it was 71% in 1990. That's quite a change. 50% of people gave to charities a few years ago, but in 2000, about 75% did. I find this fascinating. The Americans 15 years or older only spend about 56 minutes a day socializing or communicating, but they spend three hours watching TV and three hours playing some type of video game. This may be the saddest. 50% of Americans have fewer than three friends in 2021. That's versus only 27% had fewer than three friends in 1990. We tend to have fewer friends. We just don't seem to want to talk, eat, walk, or work, or even die with others. And that last one comes from a, a statistic that I found that I thought was just fascinating, that only about 4% of people in 1960 were cremated, and about 60% now um, are cremated. It's expected to go much higher. And the kind of trite point I make is that people don't want to spend much time together with people. And even when they die, they don't want to spend time with each other as well. There's other factors why people get cremated, of course. But it's kind of emblematic that we just don't want to spend as much time together. Reminds me of the New Zealanders. They have a kind of it's all good attitude manifested in a very relaxed vibe that says that we're not rushed and we have time for you. You're welcome here. That last statement is really important. You're welcome here. Go to New Zealand and you actually will hear that from people. Yes, it's a beautiful country. They film Lord of the Rings there. They have extreme sports like bungee jumping and zorbing. But it's their attitude and belief, philosophy, that really drives the way that they treat other people. They have a culture from the Maori people, and although I cannot, can't pronounce the word, it means hospitality, a generosity of spirit and friendliness of heart passed from one generation to the next. Stunning vistas, as I said, yes, but also laid back and good natured people. One of the things I like most, one of the expressions is, she'll be all right. I wish I could use that expression. It's a New Zealander expression that means things will work out. Why they say she or he or they, I don't know. But it says she'll be right, all right. She'll be right. Love that. And if you say that to yourself enough, you realize actually life will be all right. One of the best stories I've ever read was from Sidney Poitier and the way that he tried to carry himself. And I tried to relay that to you earlier, hope I did, but he made a statement once. He said, there's a place for people who are angry and defiant, but that's never been my role. He had every reason when he was growing up, poor and other aspects, to not be a happy person, to be vengeful, hateful, and he didn't. He didn't, he had more reasons than me or others to be unhappy, unfulfilled, but he just wasn't. He said, that's never been my role. Something that I try to remember as well. So as you're a friendly person, if you're a person like Sidney Poitier, how best can you present yourself? Well, certainly you can smile, even when alone. If you smile when you're talking to people, or just by yourself, you will naturally be a more positive person. The friendly person gives before asked and never expects anything in return. They're altruistic, more concerned about others than yourself. We've talked a lot about that. They have what I call this sunny disposition. It's what we think about ourselves when we think about ourselves. That they are more important than what we think about ourselves and others combined. It's all about others. But it's that kind of smile, things are gonna be good. It's that New Zealander attitude. And they're also compassionate. People who are compassionate or confident and considerate, and that is in more of a giving type of atmosphere. Notice how so many of these are related to just a concept of happiness and giving. We can sum all of that into happiness and giving. 
we help to meet and become a gracious person. Somebody who's courteous to those we like and those we, aren't, we don't. Who's civil in discussion with people that we enjoy and those we detest. So no matter the type of conversation, we enjoy the conversation and we don't detest the ones that we don't. We're cheerful in the best of times and the worst. And we're a friend to those who want it and those who need it. It helps makes a good place an even better place. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation, everybody. Take care.